Welcome to the Financially Healthy Church Seminar sponsored by the Stewardship Group of the United Pentecostal Church. My name is Rick Lovell, Director of Stewardship, also President of the Church Loan Fund, the United Pentecostal Foundation, and United Insurance Solutions. Over the past several years, we have been analyzing various churches as they have applied for loans with the United Pentecostal Church. Our goal was to determine what are healthy averages. What is the healthy average for uh, types of, of income coming into the church? Attendance giving, all of those kind of metrics that can help you gauge the healthiness of the church. There is a big push right now for churches to embrace the concept of healthy church. You've heard of the Healthy Church Initiative, the Church Growth Initiative, all of these elements that we are working hard with churches to help churches grow and develop in a very constructive and productive way. For the stewardship group, our focus is on the financial health of a church. As we look through these things, there are seven different areas that I would like to talk about that I would encourage you to dig into the details and the administration of your church to determine the healthy metrics that you may or may not have. As we look through these, let's start with what's not healthy. Uh, it's easy to look at something and say, well, that's not healthy or that's not healthy before you can better determine what does real true health look like. For example, no financial oversight. That's a very unhealthy thing for a church. If the pastor is the only person that is looking at the financials of the church, it gives room for errors to happen. Um, a pastor may look at financials to the point that numbers kind of become a blur to him to where it, it, you may miss a detail or two. It's also very vital that churches understand that in the, uh, the governmental oversight culture that we have right now, you know, it's, it's very likely that some churches could become audited. It's very likely that the IRS could start questioning the nonprofit status of churches. And so we want to make sure that we have all the things in place that give uh, confidence uh, to anyone who may have to look into a, a church's uh, specific administration. Another thing that's not healthy is no administrative accountability. Um, if, if a church secretary is the only one looking at deposits, um, if there's one person that is the only person that ever sees the cash that comes into the church, you know, I never want to uh, be accusatory or make assumptions that somebody is doing something wrong. Uh, but we also want to make sure that we're not allowing temptation to happen, that we're not allowing questions to come. You know, the Bible says, don't let your good be evil spoken of. Well, one of the ways that you can manage against that is making sure there's proper oversight into all of the financial metrics of a church. Another thing is an unbalanced checkbook. That's very unhealthy. Uh, you might say, well, isn't it, doesn't everybody balance their checkbook? You would think that. However, we have discovered churches that they monitor their finances online. They monitor their checking account, but they don't take time at the end of month to reconcile everything and to make sure that everything is clearing out like it's supposed to. Failure to balance and reconcile your, your checking account is a very unhealthy uh, practice within a church. Also, not having any spending policies, um, not having anything in place that, that measures it, or a budget to where a particular department knows what their spending limits are. Never establishing those policies is a very unhealthy thing. And finally, uh, the concept of just letting faith take over. Um, it, there's a thin balance between what is an act of faith and what is a good practice within a church. Um, I've had these conversations with our pastor here and, and other pastors where we, we understand the dynamic of, of trusting God to provide, but at the same time, making sure that you're properly documenting, you're properly managing what God has given you so that as we understand the scripture, to whom much is given, much is required. We understand that there is requirement to be great stewards of all that you have. And so as we look at what's not healthy, uh, we can see these things again, no financial oversight, no administrative accountability, not balancing the checkbook, no spending policies. That's very unhealthy and it's easy to recognize those things. But let's take a look now at what is healthy. Before we created this list, we researched various other denominations, we researched other uh, church management programs. I wanted to make sure that we weren't taking a, an isolated look at just United Pentecostal Church metrics. What works for everybody? What's healthy across the board? I want to dig into the details of all of these, but in an overview, number one, proper legal documentation. Making sure that your church's bylaws 
are up to date. When was the last time you reviewed the bylaws of the church? Uh, we had one church we looked at that had not reviewed their bylaws in many, many years. The bylaws were set up literally over 20 years before that. All the leadership of the church had changed. The departments of the church had changed. The, the vision of the church had changed. Make sure you take time to look at your bylaws to make sure everything is up to date. Um, even specifically looking at who is responsible for signing loan agreements. Um, we've seen bylaws that did not specifically say, you know, who is responsible. Is it trustees? You know, who, who's responsible for signing uh, loan agreements? Who's responsible for signing uh, purchase contracts? All those kind of things should be spelled out in your bylaws. The next element, of course, is your articles of incorporation, making sure that you're properly registered with the state that you're doing business in, making sure that your tax ID number is accurate for your entity and that you're not using the UPCI's tax ID number for how you uh, execute your business. The next thing is financial accountability. I want to talk more about systems and processes that should be in place. Number three, talking about membership that gives faithfully. It's very uh, essential that you look at the giving metrics of your church and, and know, are our people giving in a healthy way? Uh, the next thing is payroll. We hear a lot about payroll. I get asked questions all the time about, you know, from a church planner, when can I start taking payroll? What does payroll look like? We have some good numbers to show you that can kind of help you gauge how you're uh, measuring and managing your expenses from a payroll standpoint. And then obviously speaking even beyond that, just proper expense management in general, setting some policies and some practices in place that, that helps everyone be able to function within a budget. And with that, what I call financial alignment. I'm going to talk about what it means to be financially aligned in your income and expense reports. And then the last thing, the establishment of reserve funds. We'll talk about that and how to do that. One of the things I want to talk about are healthy church systems. We have, uh, in our analysis of, of churches, we do surveys and we ask them, what programs are you using? There's two types of programs that we want to categorize. The first one is accounting programs. With these, the top three that we hear about the most often, of course, is QuickBooks, Aplos, and ChurchTrack. Uh, we also know of churches that use Excel spreadsheets, but I would encourage you to get an operating system that actually helps you not just uh, measure and manage, but it can create great reports. Um, if you're going to apply for a loan, whether it's through the church loan fund or any lending institution in America, you're going to have to provide income and expense reports, profit and loss statements, cash flow statements. Everybody has a different terminology for it. But the ability to quickly and easily create those documents is essential to having a healthy overview of a church's finances. The other column that we look at is the actual church management software. So managing your attendance, managing your membership, managing all of the ways uh, that maybe you, you collect information for events or uh, you track birthdays or any of those kind of metrics. Also, the ability to create contribution statements. There are you know programs like QuickBooks that are great for managing the accounting of a church, but th that program itself does not create contribution statements that are subject to IRS regulations. There are other programs that do, though. You've seen programs like Planning Center, Breeze, again, Church Track. These are programs that uh, can do, do all of the church management side. The only program that we have found, and if there's another one, I would love to hear about it. The only program that we know of that does both accounting, true accounting, and church management is Church Track. And you'll find that at churchtrack.com. Now, for full disclosure, uh, we are not in partnership with them. Uh, we don't get any money from promoting them. I just know there's a lot of churches that use churchtrack.com, especially smaller churches. What we typically see is once a church uh, gets up into the attendance in that, you know, 120, 150 or above, we start seeing those churches move more into QuickBooks and Planning Center. But the smaller churches, a program like Church Track can serve a full need of a church, especially those that have less than 100 people in your congregation. Moving along, we also see online giving tools. Online giving is an essential element to have inside your church. Please don't depend on just checks and cash to be able to fund the ministry that you're leading. Um, we hear of programs, even some like PayPal is still used, Tithely, Giveify, Square, uh, Breeze, Faith Teams, Planning Center Giving. 
These are all very common programs that we see uh, churches utilizing. I know there are others out there, and I would encourage you to use whatever works for your church. And one of our uh, studies that we were doing, um, I came across some information that I found very useful, and I wanted to share it in this program. A financially healthy church utilizes multiple ways to give. For example, churches that offer online giving see a 12% increase in total revenue. Uh, when I was pastoring and we rolled out an online giving thing, our first year, we saw giving increase 15% across the board. I am very happy uh, to pay a 2 or 3% uh, it, it cost for having that service if I'm going to see a 15% or a 12% increase in total giving. It's worth the cost of offering this service. On the same hand, surveys have shown that digital givers give on average 24% more than just check or cash givers. Something to think about when you're looking at how do we expand our, our giving uh, scope of giving. And then one of the facts that we discovered that I found to be extremely interesting is that when you offer online giving, studies have shown that only 27% of the money comes in on Sunday. 73% of the money comes in the other six days of the week. When people develop a practice of giving, if it's Friday and it's payday, a lot of people will go online right then and give to the church. This is something that we're seeing more and more across the board. So don't depend on just Sunday offerings to support the finances of the church. Give people an opportunity to give every day of the week. Moving along, when we talk about healthy giving metrics, one of the questions that we wanted to answer was, what is the average giving per attendee? There are some programs that you can look at or websites that you can read about other denominations that talk about giving per donor. But with the United Pentecostal Church, what we find is people track their attendance numbers. You can just about ask anybody, what'd you have on Sunday? How many people are you running right now? You'll have those numbers easy. What we don't have is very good numbers on how many people actually give to the church. Not many churches actually measure that number. And so we look at total giving divided by total attendance. On average, for the churches that we have analyzed, we see average giving around $2,095 or $2,100 per attendee. So if you're looking at how much income should our church have, looking somewhere in that $2,100 per attendee is a healthy metric to look at. Now, what we see, though, is a wide range. There may be a church, maybe in your area, uh, it may not be as econo economically astute. It may be, you know, more, uh, you may have more poverty in your county. And so your numbers may be lower than that. But I would say across the board, somewhere in that 1800 to 2400 should be a healthy range for people who are disciplined and discipled to giving to the church. And then as you look at those numbers, the 80 20 rule comes into play. About 80% of a UPC church's budget will be tithing. About 20% will be all the other offerings. If that's a case, and if that works across the board, then that means your average attendee is giving approximately 12.5% of their personal income, so a little bit more than tithing. Um, we know that that's healthy in the United Pentecostal Church. What we see that's not healthy is when a church is split 90-10 or 95-5. In other words, 95% of the church's total budget is tithing, and only 5% is giving to all the other offerings. Making sure you're giving your people an education on how giving works and what the difference between tithing and offering is so that they can give and be blessed according to the principles of the word of the Lord. As you're comparing your church to churches across the board, we have developed a budgeting calculator and we have it on our church loan fund website. We'll show a screenshot of this so you can see what it looks like. We look at five areas of income and five areas of expenses um, and you can kind of see based on your attendance, there's some slider bars over on the left-hand side where you can adjust your attendance and you can measure out, you know, if our church grows from 50 people to 80 people, how does that affect the, the budget? How does that allow for, for, for loan capacity or renting a building or adding payroll? You can play with that and see how that all works together. Again, this is not to be uh, a, a, you know, hard 
you know, written in stone. This is what your church has to be at. These are just healthy averages that we see across the board. Moving along now to target expenses. Um, in this slide here, you'll see three categories. We'll see the expenses of a church broken down into salary, debt or rent, and then finally operations. Using this element, you'll see that as churches grow, these percentages change. Again, like I mentioned before, one of the questions I get asked is, at what point can a pastor start taking a salary? What we have seen in our review of churches is that churches that have less than 25 people, only about 5% of their budget goes to support uh, the pastor. It could start as a housing allowance. It may start as uh, you know paying for the cell phone, paying a car payment, um, something in that regards, depending on uh, the type of arrangements that you have uh, for the pastor there. But as you move into actual salary, you can see as a church grows, you know, as it goes from 26 to 50 people, we see that increase, the payroll increase to about 15% of, of total tithes and offerings. As it goes from 51 to 100, you see it 25. And you'll notice that when a church gets to about 100 people or more, you see a, a, a quite a jump in the percentage of the total tithes and offerings that goes to salary. Now, this can also be the fact that you're not just paying the pastor. You may be paying a secretary. You may be paying someone else. And so total payroll. And as you look at these numbers, please understand that this is a combination of tithes and offerings. So we're looking at the whole picture. We're not just looking at tithing. And then as a church grows, one of the interesting things we found is that financially healthy churches tend to cap out payroll somewhere in that 40% range. Uh, when it starts getting over 50%, you start seeing uh, some challenges financially to pay in other bills or supporting other ministries. And so anytime that we look at a church that is in that 40% range, uh, we know that they are managing uh, their finances in a healthy way. Of course, the struggle is in uh, the, the battle between facilities and payroll. That's where we see the most uh, struggle in and how do we get this? And I think a strategic question that you have to answer is, what do we really want? Do we need a building or do we need payroll? How do we balance that out? And I can't tell you that there's a perfect formula for that. But what I would encourage you to do is to make sure that your payroll expenses and your facility expenses collectively never exceed 70% of your total budget. Somewhere in that 60% range is what we would consider to be healthy. So 60 to 65%, again, payroll services and facility expenses is a healthy way, a healthy place to be in. If those numbers start getting up into 70, that means you are depending on 30% of your budget to run the entire church. How are you saving money? How are you creating reserve funds? What if three families lose their jobs and move out? You put yourself in quite a bind if your payroll and facility is in that 70% range. And so the next slide you can see here, we start creating a budget for this. What if we set aside a 5% net income? What if we set aside 10% for giving to other ministries and programs, investing in other fields of labor so God can bless us? How does that affect the overall scope of things? If you look at this and then go back to our website and look at our budgeting tool, you'll see how you can work these numbers around to develop a healthy metric for your local church. The next thing I wanna talk about is financial alignment making sure that your church departments are not fully subsidized by general offerings or even even tithing. This is a uh, this is a strategic thing that you have to determine. What percent of of the ladies ministry, the youth ministry, the men's outings, uh outreach, a food pantry, any of those type of things that you have, how much of that are you willing to subsidize from the general fund versus how much are are you requiring them to raise their own funds and do fundraisers that help support all those ministries of the church? Um, we see churches struggle uh, financially whenever they they don't have any types of fundraisers and they subsidize all of these programs 100%. I would encourage you to look at how much uh, building maybe that you need, uh, you maybe loan that you need to borrow and look at where can we come up with this cash flow. It could be right there in your budget if you just learn to better align the income and expenses of all of your auxiliary programs in the church. And as we talk about reserve funds, I always encourage people, encourage churches to have three to six months in operating expense reserves. Now that is not total expenses of the church. 
And I want to show you a calculator here. You can see on the screen that facility expenses and payroll expenses are what we call operating expenses. This is how much money it takes to actually function the church. That's not uh, buying flowers and that's not uh, doing extra programs. This is just to keep the doors open, to keep everybody paid, to keep the rent paid, uh, to keep the mortgage payment paid, all of those expenses. Divide that by 12 to determine your average monthly operating expenses. And then look at how much do we need to save to have three months of that in reserves. I would strongly encourage you each month set aside a little bit at a time so that maybe over the course of a year or maybe even two years, you build up a reserve fund so that God forbid, you know, you, you can't have church for several weeks or, or for some reason, uh, you know, multiple families, uh, leave the church so that you know that in this, you have a healthy reserve set in place so that it doesn't hinder the ministry of the church in total. Keep this in mind. Money doesn't save itself. It can't save itself. Money must be saved by the person in control of it. We must be intentional about how we manage our funds. Money that is out of control will disappear. It, that's just the basics of how this is done. And so I want to encourage you to be very intentional as you look at your church budget. You want to make sure that you have healthy reserves, that you have healthy spending uh, metrics in place. You have healthy spending policies in place so that the church can function and thrive in that healthy environment. Finally, I want to thank you for watching this. I want to thank you for taking a deep dive into your own uh, church's administration. If you have any questions about anything that I've said, you have a QR code here that you can scan. It'll get you a, a survey, a little information thing you fill out. The questions can come directly to me. We would love to partner with you to help you grow your church, grow the dream that God has given you, and make sure that along the way you have healthy metrics in place so that you can thrive in the dream that God has given you and the church that you lead.